On this episode of Boundary Breakers, I sit down with Paul Epstein. Paul spent 15 years as a professional sports executive, most recently as the head of sales with the San Francisco 49ers. Paul's energy is contagious and inspiring. Shares his story of a life-changing moment that made him leave professional sports to start his own business that's based on impacting and inspiring others. I honestly wasn't expecting to be so impacted by my discussion with Paul but I was, and so will you. I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. Boundary Breakers is brought to you by Carter and Clark. Again, man, thanks so much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. Um, you know, as we discuss, one of the things I like to start with, just so our audience can understand you know, our, our guests and, and who they're listening to. Can you just give us a little, a little bit of background on your origin story in terms of kind of where you grew up, your family Absolutely. life, things like that? Absolutely. And it's interesting that you say where you grew up, because while you can't tell by a last name of Epstein, but I'm a proud Mexican descent. So mi mamá nació en Nayarit. I spent a lot of my childhood in Ensenada, Mexico. I'm in LA, so only a couple hours above the border. And so most every other weekend, all the holidays, I always say it was a lot of tacos and tequila. I only had the first when I was younger, but <laughs> <laughs> now I can enjoy both, thankfully. But nice. it was awesome. You know, it's a different part of the world. And California and Mexico, even though we border each other, it does feel like two different worlds. And the, the spirit, the joy, the good times, the authenticity, like the culture, the heritage, I, I'm just such a massive fan. And like what, what that really did for me early in life, Brandon, was it gave me perspective. It gave me perspective that there's different places, there's different types of people, what really matters. You know, you don't need money to be happy or to be fulfilled or to feel like it's a life worth living. And it's, it's also humbling. It always has kept me very humbled to know that there is a different side, not only of the world, but there's also different chapters, there's different seasons. And so fast forward, LA are the roots, LA is where I'm born and raised, and that's where I went to school all the way up to undergrad at USC. And I caught some good football days. I'm sure we're gonna talk a little bit of sports in this conversation. I got very lucky, it is luck. I caught the Pete Carroll era. So that was back when, you know, Reggie and Leinard and the whole thing, like I got lucky. It was very nice, by the way, as somebody that enjoyed their social setting, and I'll just be rated PG with that. Let's <laughs> just say USC was a good time. And it was very nice to be up by 60 at halftime because it gave you permission to go back to the party. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> so, I love it. So it was cool, man. But the interesting thing is that I didn't know that you could work in an industry like I end up eventually calling a dream career and being a kid in a candy store. I didn't know that sports was more than something you watch on TV or you play in the backyard or you go to the games. I didn't know there was a business behind sports. I was a business major, but I didn't know there was sports business. Nowadays, it's common. It's very evolved. It's very mature. It, people know, starting from junior high, senior high, I did not have that exposure. So I go to USC, I end up working for a Fortune 10 and coming straight out of school and I'm calling on retail and wholesale accounts, consumer packaged goods company. And as I'm driving from account to account, of course, I have it on ESPN radio. And so whether you're a sports fan or not, there's a guy named Mel Kuyper. If you are a sports fan, he's an NFL draft guru. He starts studying kids in high school and he can tell you who's going to project well at the college level and then who from college projects well to make it to the NFL and at what level are they a first rounder, second. So if you know, you know, and if you don't, that's who he is. And if you know Mel Kuyper, you know that he talks like this. Like he is just a high energy, high intense. <laughs> he's a guy. And he can, even through the radio, really connect. And so he comes on ESPN Radio, first commercial. I'll never forget this moment. He says, have you ever wanted to work in sports? Have you ever dreamed of working for your favorite NFL, NBA, MLB? And I'm speeding down the highway yelling, yes, yes, yes. And then his call to action was, call 1-800-SMWW-NOW. SMWW stands for Sports Management Worldwide. I made the call. I took the eight-week online course. The professors and instructors were impressed. And they said, where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? 
will make the calls. That was part of the commitment at the beginning of the program. And I said, well, I'm not ready to leave LA. I want to be in LA. They said, great. We know folks at the Staples Center. Mind you, this is circa 2004 slash five. Kobe and Shaq are winning championships with the Lakers. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to work for the Lake Show. <laughs> and they did call Staples Center for me. And I end up working for the Clippers. So oh, wow. <laughs> I will pause there, but but it was it was a pretty gnarly start, man. I mean, entry level sales guy, ESPN called us the worst brand in sports at that time. We were definitely the redheaded stepchild of the building. And then I still remember there was the front cover of Sports Illustrated back when magazines were still a thing, right? Front cover of Sports Illustrated. It's got three Clipper fans on it. The title of that publication, that that specific magazine was the worst franchise in sports history. There's three Clipper fans with paper bags on their heads and the middle bag on the forehead says, just shoot me. So <laughs> welcome, welcome to sports and welcome to sales, Paul Epstein. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, that's a fantastic synopsis and a fantastic summary. Um, but it is interesting, you know, I mean, the, the, the title of this podcast is Boundary Breakers. And historically, at least it, in my mind, when I think about uh, you know, professional sports executives, you usually think of somebody that's either, you know, a former player or, you know, uh, or a manager or was involved sort of on the other side of the, of the line, not in the front office, and then ended yeah. up either retiring or making their way to that. And so the fact that, that you ended up with a unbelievably successful career in professional athletics, um, and took a different journey, I think is really interesting. And you certainly broke some boundaries um, to get there. But it's also fascinating that that I know that there's a lot more to it than that. You probably went through 10 different interviews and, and had to work your way up. But the fact that you called a 1-800 number to sort of get into the industry is, uh, you know, that that's a story in and of itself. It's fantastic. Well, so you find yourself at the Clippers. What type of role did you have and, and you know, Tell us about sort of, you know, your your professional sports career all the way up and through the uh, with the 49ers. Absolutely. So if you've seen the movies, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, yeah. Or Boiler Room or Wolf of Wall Street. And you position those inside of the sports industry. That was me. I was wow. a phone banger. OK, I was, it was the equivalent of knocking on doors in Glengarry Glen Ross. It was the equivalent of instead of selling shady stocks, here I am selling bad basketball. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, but, but, but that's how so, it starts, you know? Like I, I, my friends, when they said, oh my gosh, you got the job at Staples Center. And then when I told them what I eventually did, for one, they thought I was a guy with a sideways visor behind like a ticket booth counter behind the glass. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, they thought Eating I was in popcorn. the box office. And then the other thing is, of course, being a, a head the Lakers town, especially at that time. Now it's a little bit more balanced, but Lakers are always still going to be the brand. But all my friends said, why aren't you working for the Lakers? And I responded, they don't need me. They're sold out. There's no inventory. Like there's no widgets to sell. And so you go where the opportunity is. And you actually said something too that I'll double click on too, because you said, hey, you call the 1-800 number and there's something to being a boundary breaker about that. And I agree because there is a ancient philosopher Seneca that has a phenomenal saying, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So luck has it that I had it on the right radio station at the right time. I was ready to hear it, ready to act on it. And we'll talk all about decisions and actions as a byproduct of this conversation. I fundamentally believe even right now in this podcast, if you're listening in, you could just have a great time and kick your feet up and stay on the treadmill or stay driving the car, do what you do. And it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I promise you that. That's the minimum. The maximum is you take a minimum of one thing and you do something about it on Monday. You do it. You take a decision. You take an action. You do because I'm just a fundamentally like diehard believer that the ROI of every conversation we have, can there can be a transformation waiting for you on Monday. And you'll hear more about my backstory and how there was a Monday that changed my life. But really, Brandon, for me, the other blessing that I had when it was at the Clippers, it wasn't just working for the underdog. I, I believe that if you said, Paul, why did your career turn out to be so successful? Like really anchor it down on one or two or three things. And I would tell you, I don't believe that I am where I am. And I don't even believe I am who I am from a 
character perspective, from a grit perspective, from a tenacity perspective, from a hunger perspective, if I didn't start by working for the underdog. Like if I started in the beverage industry, I never worked for Coke. I never worked for Pepsi. I worked for the can that said cola on it. Yeah. Okay. I worked for that. And when you work for that, nothing is handed to you. Nothing is given to you. So even fast forward to the Niners, and I'm going to connect the dots in between. I was at the Niners when we were losing games. Now, present day, we're winning a lot of games. At the time, the Warriors in Golden State, they had their whole dynasty going on. And my buddies would call me and say, hey, brother, we're kicking and you know, blah, 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 blah. I'll keep the language clean on this show. Yeah. But needless to say, I was like, oh, that's cool. So you're really good at picking up inbound calls. That's awesome. <laughs> like I, I would throw it back in their face. Like, dude, I'm not giving you any credit. I'm not giving you any credit. Oh, I generated $2 million of sales. So what? So what? People know where to find you. Yeah. When you have to scrap and claw for everything, that's being a boundary breaker. And being a boundary breaker is there is no boundary that you do not stay you just have to be hungry enough to break through it. Like there has to be a deeper why, a deeper burn, a deeper passion, a deeper purpose. It's more than just a product. It's more than just a service. And the number one product and service in the world is yourself. Amen. So if you're not going to sell yourself like it's the last day in the earth, then nobody else is. And so you hear it in my voice, like the same way that I found success selling the Clippers was I really taught myself about controllables. And I taught myself about what are some things that I can do at this early stage of my career that are 100% in my control. It'll insulate me from the negativity of the environment because believe me, there was a lot of toxic energy, a lot of booing, a lot of F-bombs, a lot of, it was rough in those early stages. But I found a couple of things that I could really make my calling cards. And here it was. And then I eventually introduced this when I got promoted to sales manager as the LA Clippers, and I'll tell you the end of that story as well. Work ethic, positivity, and coachability. I fundamentally believe that that has been the through line of every single chapter of my career. I work my tail off. I stay relentlessly positive no matter how negative or toxic an environment gets. And when you say coachability, I'm an unfinished product till the day I die. I'm obsessed with growth. I'm obsessed with progress. I'm obsessed with momentum. I'm obsessed with being 1% better tomorrow than I am today. I'm obsessed with being 1% better today than I was yesterday. That is how I roll. And I taught myself how to really fundamentally believe in these three controllables. So now, fast forward, we kick some butt on the scoreboards. We sell a lot of tickets at the Clippers. I was the only person in a room of 12 that ended up getting a promotion. Most of them just fell off the wayside. And like I say that from a place of pride to say like, man, this was not easy. It was not easy to survive in that environment. But eventually, you know, you sell a lot of widgets and now they say manage and supervise the widget sellers. So great. So I get promoted and I'm in that seat. And I remember as difficult as it was to recruit, we would have never been able to fill a sales room with one-to-one -one interviews. So we would do group interviews. We would cast a wide net and pack the boardrooms of Staples Center and I would do the pitch. But here was the pitch. I said, I know this is a six to nine month program. And if you are to accept being a part of our inside sales program, I'm gonna need one thing from you. You're gonna have to sign this constitution. This constitution is our commitment to meet at the 50, meet at the 50, spirit of partnership. If you give me these three things, which of course, you know where I'm going with this. This is the work ethic, the positivity, the coachability. If you give me those three things, I will take care of you the rest of your life. And they said, well, hold on, hold on. Like, what about the revenue? What about the metrics? What about the goals? What about the scorecard? What about the KPIs? And I said, not important. I'm not going to extend an offer to you if I don't think you can do the job. So you don't need to worry about that. If I don't think you can sell, you're not going to get the offer. So don't worry. If I extend an offer, it's because I believe you have the skill, but I cannot coach you on the will. And in, in the way I describe it now during my keynotes is as leaders, knowing a lot of leaders are listening in, you can't coach care. I'll repeat that. You cannot coach care. There is no wand to make somebody care. They either do or they don't. It has to be, they are willing to lean in, participate, work their, 
So for me, then if care was the umbrella, I said, I only want to extend offers to people that care. Well, how can they prove they care? Guess what? Three things. Work ethic, positivity, coachability. I don't have a wand to make you work harder. I don't have a wand to make you positive in a negative and toxic environment. I don't have a wand to get you obsessed with growth and obsessed with being 1% better and being coachable. I don't have a wand. And so when I hired people that had those three traits, and guess what, Brandon? Not everybody made it. Some people, sales was not for them. Uh, you could say bad hire. I would say, huh, well, hey, it's random. You know, you put offers out and like, it is what it is. Yeah. But I still, to this day, am holding up my end of the constitution. I'm still getting phone calls and texts and DMs. Hey, Paul, can you be a reference? Hey, Paul, I'm going through a rough patch. Hey, Paul, I just need some advice. Hey, Paul, I just want to catch up and have a beer. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I have lifelong friends that came from that chapter, not with my top producers, not with my top performers, but with the people that showed up with work ethic, positivity, and coachability. We signed a constitution together, and here's the end of that story. 30 NBA teams, I inherited an inside sales department that finished 28th out of 30, and in one year, we went to number two. Same bad product on the court. We went from number 28 out of 30 to number two out of 30. And wow. that was the difference. Wow. Wow. That is extremely impressive. And you know, gosh, you said a lot of things that that I would love to spend Yeah, I didn't spend, even cover the, the last on. 80% of my yeah. sports journey, but I just figured yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. No, no, it no. back to you and kind of let's yeah. dance. No, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. And you know, one thing that you said that, that I continue to become uh, more convinced of is, look, on, on this show, I've been fortunate to, to interview some really, really interesting people. Navy SEALs, CEOs, folks from Delta Force. I mean, folks that have made it to the, you know, 0.00001%. Mm, and love that you said that. And one of the things that I'm always curious about is like, are there are there commonalities amongst all these people, right? I mean, totally different industries, totally different drive determination, you know, from a Navy SEAL to person, you know, the the founder of of Keller Williams real estate, the largest real estate firm in the, in the, in the world. And to a person, it, it's, it's, it, it amazes me that every one of them have said either directly or indirectly that, look, I was born with a fire and yeah. it is a fire that I can't control, put out, extinguish, but it, but I just want, I have a drive and a need that is insatiable within me to be, to, to, to do more, do bigger, to be, to be, you know, to generate what I define um, as success. And it's just interesting. You said, you know, it's, it's, you can't coach. That's something you can't coach. And, and, and some people are born with it. Others are perfectly okay, um, sort of where they are in terms of, of if, if they, whether it's their career or their spiritual life, they're okay. They, they sort of want to maintain status quo. And there's those other few that, you know, wherever they are will never be where they want to be or will never be good enough. It's, it's, it's a, it's a something inside that makes us want to keep driving and keep getting better. And it's what I love about this show because, you know, it's folks like you, right. That, that, um, you know, we've known each other for all of, of 20 minutes and it's very obvious to me that you have something in you, um, that is extraordinarily powerful that drives you, that gets you up each day and makes you want to become a better person, a better leader, a better author, a better, uh, speaker, a better mentor, et cetera. And it's just, it's fascinating to me. That's just a, my, my quick aside. The other thing that, that, um, you mentioned, you mentioned grit and tenacity, you know, sort of that work ethic side of thing. And, and I could not agree more. Um, it, it, it reminds me of a lot of the things that Nick Saban talks about with regard to how to become excellent. And, and that, you know, if you focus on like in your, in, in your case, if they, if they were to focus on the metrics or sales or or you know how many people did I um, how many people did I went over uh, to buy season tickets or what have you or to buy a suite that you know that that's not the avenue for success. If you focus on if you have the what's important and you focus on the process, those things are are result are are sort of yeah. th they, those things are are products of you know doing the right um, taking the right steps and having the right mindset. H have you? You know, speaking of the grit, the tenacity, determination, and that fire, have you always, like from when you were young, have you always had a, been really driven 
to want to do something special in life? Hmm. It's a great question. The truth is, you'll never know who you were as a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10 You can hear stories, but I can tell you that right now I consider one of my superpowers unshakable confidence. And I can clearly tell you that that was not always the case. I used to, my mom always jokes with me. She, you know, because fast forward and I ended up being known as the Y coach after this life-changing retreat. I'm sure we'll talk all about that with the Niners, but I became very purpose-driven and that's where a lot of the passion and the burn that, you, that you've already heard today in this conversation comes from. And it's a lot tied to my late father and losing my hero at 19 years old. So there's, there's, there's a lot of peaks and there's a lot of valleys that I've already been through. And I'm happy to talk about any of them. But she always says, it's interesting how now you're known as the Y guy but you always used to be a what's the point guy. Like I didn't always go for it. As somebody that wrote a book called The Power of Playing Offense, I don't think I used to play offense, definitely not consistently. And so I didn't always get in the mix. It was, it was really, I now have a very clear picture. It's almost like a Venn diagram of when things start to flow out of you, when you see somebody working their tail off. And again, you can't coach them to do that. They just naturally want to do it. If you gave me 95%, here's a cool thing to share with you. I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but happy to. If you gave me 95% of jobs in the world, I'm not convinced that I would work hard. I'm not. Because I wouldn't care about them. Those aren't my things. I think you need to find your thing and then it does. I don't need to try to work hard. Brandon, right now I wake up religiously at 4 a.m. because I want to. Right. I want to. I do the work in the unseen hours. I am even stronger behind closed doors than I am on stage. I am so disciplined. I'm so committed and nobody has to remind me. Nobody has to tell me. But if you told me to go do X, Y, Z in a different field, in a different industry and go get a paycheck and not be in, in my mission and my calling and my pursuit of what I am destined to do, which is everything that I'm doing today, you're not going to see the best version of Paul. You're just not. I could do it temporarily. It wouldn't sustain, it wouldn't last, it wouldn't be organic, it wouldn't be authentic. So therefore, it wouldn't be excellent. Right. And so, you know, a couple of things to double click on too with what you said, Nick Saban, and the immediate thought that comes to my mind is standards. We could call it a standard of excellence. Cool. Here's something I want to share with our audience right now. To be great, obsess over standards not goals. Standards over goals. Standards over goals. Standards, you can rise to the level of a standard every single day. Goals, even if you're amazing at what you do, you're going to hit a lot, you're going to miss some. We're all human, but you never have to miss your standards. And so when you establish clarity around a standard, that's somebody that I would bet on. So that's one thing, standards over goals. Now, you might have heard me a handful of minutes ago, Brandon, talking about, or I, I almost said I love that when you said, quote, 0.000001% in the world of what they did. I use the exact same metaphor for this. So when I was in the NFL and NBA, that is the top 0.00001% in the world at what they do. And what fascinated me is their gifts, their talents, their skills, their abilities, it's not even their separator anymore. They made it. They're at the major leagues. In college, they were better than the competition. High school, they were a man amongst boys. But now the fraction of gap of talent or gift or skill or ability in the NFL and NBA, the best player versus the worst player, there's not that much of a difference in their gifts and talents. So then why do some of them thrive and others fail? Why are some super consistent and some are radically inconsistent? It's not gifts, talents, and abilities. So I started to study 
What is that silver bullet separator? And I don't disagree with what all your other guests have said as far as the hunger and the passion and the burn and the, I use obsession. Yes, of course, of course. That's the fuel, that's oxygen. That means that you're doing the right thing. However, I do have a silver bullet separator and then even a process on how we can all apply it to our own lives. When I started to study why some players in the NFL and NBA are consistently excellent, they are highly resilient, they are constantly evolving and iterating to become the best version of themselves, here was the gap between them and the rest of the pack. Confidence. Confidence became their currency. Confidence was their fuel. Confidence was their oxygen. They were dialed in. If I play in the NFL and I'm a cornerback, so I'm guarding a wide receiver, if you smoke me and I give up a touchdown, I have to be able to say next play. Like the way that they just almost, this power of neutrality. Yeah. Like they, they don't have, if the average person gets plus eight when something amazing happens and gets minus eight when something horrible happens, these dudes bottom out at a minus one. It's just a minus one. It's like, it happened. I can't do anything about it. Move on. Now, there's a trade-off. We also, and I put myself in this camp, we struggle to smell the roses a little bit So because it's kind of a pendulum, right? A plus eight can become a minus eight. If you bottom out at a minus two, you might never feel more than a plus two, but that's okay. It's a worthwhile trade-off because it just kind of keeps you grounded. It keeps your equilibrium. It keeps you neutral. But this level of confidence, I've been really researching it and studying it. Literally, the subtitle of my second book would title Better Decisions Faster, subtitle, unshakable confidence when you need it most, that forced me into the lab to really study confidence. And why do some people lack it? Why do some people have it? Why are some consistent? Why not? My life has been two chapters, pre-confidence and post-confidence. And so I really was motivated to understand why did I used to lack confidence? Why was I inconsistent? I had a good outcome, so I was confident. I had a bad outcome. I was not confident. I'm still Paul. So now, if something horrible happens in my business tomorrow, which it very well might, fine, I'll figure it out. We'll move forward. That sucks, but we're going to be all right. I can't promise you I'm going to be all right in a week. I promise you a bigger picture. My stock will always go up and to the right. It's going to be jagged. There's up like, I get it. But if you are a stock, just make sure that you're constantly going up and to the right. So here's a process for confidence, and then I'll kick it back to you. This is something you mentioned folks that have been on your show, Brandon. I have coached this to Navy SEALs. I have coached this process to Olympic athletes. I have coached this to Shark Tank entrepreneurs. I have coached this to Fortune 100 CEOs. And it is transformational. And here it is. There's a formula. And then there's a way that we put it on paper to bring it to life. The formula for how you build and sustain unshakable confidence is confidence equals values times action. I'll repeat that. Confidence equals values times action. The multiplication is how consistently you do it. In other words, show me a person that takes consistent action on their values. I will show you a confident person, period, full stop. So now let's put it on paper. The first step is you got to know what your strongest core value is. If you don't already know, let me give you a cheat sheet. If you're listening and you say, I don't have a freaking clue what my values are, or I have an idea, but I don't know, like eh, Google a list of personal core values. You'll come up with lists of 50, 70, 100. Choose the one that jumps off the screen. It jumps off the page. It just speaks to you in a way where the Latin definition of inspire is it breathes life into you. It should be a word that inspires you. It should be a word that breathes life in you. Pick that word. Now, the process for how you put it on paper is this. The good news is you only have to do it once a week and it only takes two minutes. It's a journal. And this is what I've coached to SEALs, Olympians, CEO, Shark Tank, the whole thing. This is the process. The journal reads, for the week ahead, I will live my value of blank by blank. The first blank is the value that you just chose. The second is an action that you connect to the value. Remember, confidence equals value times action. This is how we put it on paper. So to repeat it, the sentence is, for the week ahead, I will live my value of insert value here, by insert action that's connected to the value. Let's play with a few hypothetical examples. Let's say you chose a value like joy. Awesome. So you could journal something like, 
For the week ahead, I will live my value of joy by cooking my favorite meal. Sweet, simple, small, accessible. Anybody in the world could do it. For me, I'm throwing bacon in a pan. What are you doing? Whatever brings you joy, you do you. So that's joy. Now, Brandon, let's up the ante a little bit. Instead of joy, let's go with courage. Let's say you chose a value like courage, which is one of my personal ones. You could journal something like, for the week ahead, I will live my value of courage by having that challenging conversation that I've been putting off. You wouldn't be having the conversation because Paul said you would have the conversation because courage was a core value. So now you know how the process works. Final critical caveat, and then I'll kick it back to you. I don't care if it's a SEAL, an Olympian, a Fortune CEO, me, you, anybody listening in. If we only do this process, this journal, one or two times, and you do it once a week, no change, no transformation. I'm sorry. I'd be lying to you. The good news is I've shared this with thousands of people, and I now clearly see the delineation of when transformation occurs, and it's because habits form. It's the same reason why New Year's resolutions are ineffective. We don't have a consistent practice or process or system. We don't stick with it long enough. Our heart's not into it. We're, ma we're making decisions for the wrong reasons. This is based on a core value, so your heart cares. Remember, you can't coach care. So it means something to you. It matters to you. And then the beauty of habits is we have enough science and research to back this. Habits form in three to four weeks. Consistent practice, consistent process, consistent system for three to four weeks, it will stick as a habit. So, shocker, the action item is commit to four weeks. Get past that threshold of habit formation. Stick to the same value for four consecutive weeks. Joy for four weeks. Growth for four weeks. Impact for four weeks. Excellence for four weeks. Courage for four weeks. And I swear to you, Shark Tank, Fortune, Olympians, SEALs, everyone listening in, the fourth week is when things explode because you might have journaled one action, but because it's now internally a habit loop, value, decision, action, value, decision, action, value, decision, action. And that's how you become the most confident version of yourself because the simplest way to describe it is you're keeping the promises you make to yourself. When you journal an action, connect to something that matters to your core, like a value, and you do it, Week after week after week, momentum builds, habits form, and confidence is the outcome. Fascinating. Fascinating. Look, I, as support to, you know, you, you, you started the discussion highlighting that what's the difference but amongst um, sort of the, the elite among the elite, be, um, and you, you remarked that it was confidence. Um, just sort of to, to highlight that, I, I was fortunate enough to hear a, a fantastic uh, world famous sports psychologist by the name of um, Bob Rotella speak. And he spoke to a small group and he, he, he's worked with um, like some of the top golfers in the world, Phil Mickelson, LeBron James. He's worked with a lot of the world famous athletes um, on the psychology of what, what, how to get better even though they're already am are among the best. And his, his thesis um, you know, supports yours. I mean, he was very clear. He said th that uh, he, in, in his mind, it was confidence. And he used the PGA Tour as a great example, that the, the, the level that, that there is a minuscule difference in the level of talent amongst everyone on the PGA Tour. In fact, there are more talented players physically that aren't on the PGA Tour that could be. And, That's fascinating. Yeah. And that the difference is 100% in their mind. And just one last just anecdote that I found anecdote that I found fascinating is, you know, he, he delivered this thesis and then he said he explained how he helps athletes. And there was one uh professional basketball player that came to him that was amongst the leading in all statistical categories except for three-point shooting. And he's like, "What can I do to get better?" Well, uh Rotella talks to his his team and gets all of the tape, like all the videos of this 
um, this guy playing from when he was in high school through present day and had it cut up. And the highlight reel was every three-point shot he's ever taken and made. And then he went back and asked, hey, I need like your three favorite, uh, w- w- like three favorite songs at the moment. And like, you know, who's your favorite artist? So it, he, he overlaid those songs and it ended up being like a 15 minute video of the basketball player making three pointers over and over and over and over again. And um, I don't remember the exact stat, but the next season, you know, he increased his three point percentage by like six, six percentage points. And, and, and he was very clear, like there's more to it. I mean, obviously he had to practice. I mean, of like, course. All types of stuff, but that was just, you know, he said, you know, something as simple as visualizing himself making yeah. the three-pointer. So I, I just thought that was fascinating. It sort of relates to sports. I don't pretend to know what I'm talking about. I'm just re- was relaying what, what I thought was a fascinating discussion, but it, it, it supports exactly what you said with regard to confidence. I'm curious. So, so you, you know, you eventually make it to the 49ers. Um, tell us a little bit about your role there. And then will you tell us about the life-changing moment that you had that that led to your current career or your current Absolutely. what you're currently doing now. Absolutely. So the the bookends of the sports career, which in total ended up being about 15 years. Clippers were the beginning, Niners were the end. I'll talk about the Jerry Maguire leap from the Niners. But in between New Orleans Hornets, now they're the Pelicans. The really fascinating part there was we almost lost a team to permanent relocation. So again, if the Clippers were walking through fire, yet another fire <laughs> come in for me via New Orleans. And we had to have a franchise saving campaign, make it bigger than basketball. And, and that's a whole nother conversation. Hop over to the Sacramento Kings. And now, yes, director of sales, but really HR took a liking to me. So they said, we'd love for you to champion all of our culture initiatives. Basically, it's almost before there was a thing called the chief people officer. Yeah. That's kind of what I was doing beyond the sales scope and the leadership scope. And then three months after that, tap on the shoulder, bang, league-wide labor lockout. So how do you manage morale when it feels like people's livelihoods are taken away? And so yet another fire to walk through. Then I joined an agency, a global sports agency owned by the Yankees, Cowboys, and financial backing partners as well. So the Jones family, Steinbrenner family, definitely a lot of blue chip brands, a lot of high powered weight there. And it lands me in the NFL league office to consult for roughly a year to oversee revenue for the first Super Bowl in the history of New York. And so, you know, you can think about HQ and 345 Park Ave is right down the road and then hop over the river and right there, it's like now Big Apple and welcome to the biggest sporting event in history and this whole thing. And I'm heading up a 50 person sales army spread throughout the country to basically, we did a 5X revenue growth expectation versus the prior year, set some all-time Super Bowl revenue records. So that turned a lot of heads to say, who are all these people? And because I was kind of the point guard of that campaign, I did, humbly speaking, get a, a big spotlight out of it. And that's when the Niners came calling and said, we're opening up Levi Stadium. It's going to be a building and venue unlike the world has ever seen. We're going to have to monetize it 365 versus just the 10 dates of football. What if we created an executive level role for you? It ends up being head of sales, chief revenue officer type role. But basically, it was a created role because of the work that I did at the NFL League office and breaking those Super Bowl revenue records. And so I was in a total dreamland there, Brandon, because it, for one, I'm a football guy. So to no offense to basketball, but my heart was always in football. I just it was the hardest nut to crack. It, it, nobody leaves NFL jobs. So it's really hard to get in, but through these circumstances and performance and the right people believing in me, here's actually a cool insight to share with you. Cause you said earlier, Oh, you must've had 10 interviews in between. That's not far off from the truth. Let's call the number five, six, seven, whatever it was. But here's the cool news. My last cold interview of my life was LA to new Orleans. I have had nothing but interviews ever since then that have you ever heard the saying of don't throw up on yourself right when you when it's like hey you're pretty you're not being handed the opportunity but it's like dude we already put in a good word don't screw up the interview pretty please right because now they're putting their name on you that's pretty much how all of my hops after new orleans went somebody fell in love with how i was showing up and the type of output and the type of performance and the character and the dna and the spirit and the positivity and the energy and it's like paul we got a spot. We got a spot. We got a spot. We got a spot. So 
that's a beautiful lesson for all of us to like, yeah, break your own boundaries, but earn the right where people are willing to break a boundary for you too, Ooh. right? Like let's, let's win together and create fans and ambassadors of you. And that was a big thing for me that I always authentically tried to surround myself with a tribe of like-minded, like-hearted people that just wanted to be equally as excellent. And we just supported each other. Now, Niners, it was a wonderful place, still to this day, the favorite place that I ever worked because of the culture. The culture was what separated that place. And I got to catch two different regimes. There was the Harbaugh regime, the Lynch and Shanahan regime, and it was different. I'm going to be kind about this and talk about the second half of my time at the Niners. But when Lynch and Shanahan came in, they rebuilt the culture brick by brick when we weren't winning a lot of games on the field and so morale wasn't always sky high in the front office. But the way that they showed up instantly, Brandon, I knew if this is how they're going to treat people for the long game, I bet you we're going to start winning a lot of football games again eventually. And these guys are going to be the reason. And sure enough, at the time we're recording this, in the last three, four years, a couple Super Bowl appearances, and yeah, like some seasons haven't turned out well in the last game, but dude, we're as good as any team in the NFL, and it's because of those two guys and their leadership and how they showed up. And I saw, I felt the difference. I felt the authenticity. I felt the belief in each other, in the environment. They tore down a wall. It usually was football over here and business over there. And don't you dare cross over the wall. They said, screw down the, screw the wall, tear it down brick by brick. We're going to rebuild it. So I was really loving that chapter. If you would have asked me then, are you ever going to leave the Niners? I would have said, no. If you would have asked me, what else would you do if you didn't work in the sports industry? I, I would have said, what are you talking about? Like I'm retiring a sports guy. But here I am having a conversation with you seven, eight years later. I got no regrets that I left sports on my own terms. And to this day, I've never felt more alive because I made my decision based on one thing and one thing only. I found my why. It was a leadership offsite retreat, late 2016. For context, March of 2016, a month after we host Super Bowl 50, of which I got to play a phenomenal role in. And it was just really, again, a kid in a candy store type of experience to work at a place that hosts Super Bowl 50. And you're responsible for some of the biggest metrics that are out there. Amazing. And a month after Super Bowl 50, while the paint was still drying at midfield, the 5-0, my best friend, my rock, my soulmate and I, we got married on that 50-yard line. The wow. venue was her idea, I swear. Wow. So I found me a sports fan. She said, let's get married at the stadium. And we literally did it at midfield a month after Super Bowl 50. So when oh. I tell you, Brandon, that this retreat was five months later, I hope it's obvious. I wasn't running away from anything. Yeah. Life was really freaking good. There was nothing broken. I had nothing to fix. I was good. But then I go to this retreat handful of months after the wedding. And I haven't been the same person since. I finally figured out who I am inside out. I had this burn of not just passion. I had a burn of purpose. I had clarity on my values. I had more intention in the way that I wanted to live going forward. I got so obsessed with this retreat experience that I started the following Monday, the Monday that changed my life. I made different decisions the following Monday. I took different actions the following Monday, and I tied all of those decisions and actions to my values. Remember that confidence equals values times action. I didn't have a piffy formula back then. I didn't have a cool process. I didn't have a journal. I just did the gritty work to figure it out and put this purpose-centered puzzle together. And I was the experiment. I put myself in a lab and I literally just started to challenge myself. Paul, if you really are, these are my five core values, growth, belief, authenticity, impact, and courage. If you really are those things, prove it. Show me. This is me in the mirror. And I started to take big swings of the bat for growth. 
I said, well, if you're really a person of growth and that's the mindset that you want to attack every day with, all right, Paul, prove it. Do something that you said you would never do. That would be growth. I said, okay. I put some things down on paper and on that list was go back to school. I didn't think I had to go back to school because I didn't need an MBA to become C-suite in the pro sports world. So again, I asked myself, what's the point? But what's the point is a fixed mindset. What if is a growth mindset? What if is about possibilities and opportunities? So I pulled the trigger. Literally, Brandon, this was a $150,000 investment. I ended up getting into University of Michigan, great program, executive MBA. I invested $150,000 to prove to myself that I am a person of growth. I swear to you. It was that simple. It was that simple. At a wow. time where I did not have $150,000 in the bank, okay? Like, this was a genuine, like, you want to talk about burning the boats? Burn the boats for yourself. Like, people talk about burning the boats for a business. Dude, the first boat that I ever burned was myself. I disrupted myself. And I disrupted comfort. And that's the fire that you hear in my voice. It's like, you can't turn back from that. And so... Fast forward, I go back to school and I had a conversation with my executive coach. First time I ever had a coach in my life because before that I had mentors, but I couldn't fully open up to them because they knew my boss better than they knew me. So they asked me, How, how's everything, Paul? And I was like, good, good, good. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, good, good, good. Yeah. Even if I'm 60% good, I'm done. Dude, 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 everything's fine. Right. Everything's perfect. You know, that whole thing. Everyone's been there and everyone. And, but for me, the coach here was a conversation with her and I'll never forget it. And this is what leads to the Jerry Maguire leap. She said, okay, Paul, I know what you do. You're the head of sales for a football team. Got it. What do you love about it? What do you hate about it? What do you tolerate? So love, hate, tolerate. And I answered all three. Great questions for all of us to ask about anything, a person, a place, a career, anything. Love, hate, tolerate. I answered all three. She said, go deeper on the love bucket. I said, all right, Sue Ann. Well, I love being a coach just like you. I love being a leader. I love the people side. I love the culture side. But I do, Sue Ann. I want to be a coach. That's what lights me up. And she said, awesome. On a good day, what percentage of your time do you get to do that? And I thought to myself, I'm slouching down in my chair. 20%, the truth is probably 10, but my ego puffed it up. And she said, okay, Paul, if I wave a wand and you become your boss tomorrow, does that 20% go up, down, or sideways? And I thought my boss is almost all strategy, no people. So... So, Anne, I think it'd go down. And this, Brandon, was the question that changed everything for me. She asked, so what are you after? What are you after? Such a simple question, but it can have such profound meaning, especially if you haven't asked yourself that in a long time. And so as I thought about what am I after, Brandon, I stopped asking myself that really early in my sports journey. I was just climbing to climb. I was winning to win. I was growing to grow. I was succeeding to succeed. LinkedIn profile looked sexier by the month and year. Title, money, responsibilities kept growing. Stock was going up and to the right. But that was all outside game. That retreat taught me about my inside game. And then this conversation with Sue Ann, my executive coach, who I never would have met had I not made a decision and taken a $150,000 swing of the bat to go back to school. So growth leads me to her. And that opened my mind. And then the final thing that leads to the Jerry Maguire leap, my strongest value of impact, which is my value because my late father, who I lost in 19, he was a man of impact. He taught in a continuation school where kids had been given up on. And I was told by some of his former students years after he passed, my dad was the first person that ever believed in them. And other told me, your dad gave me a reason to think that tomorrow is worth it. And when you hear that in your 20s, it changes you, man. Yeah. My whole lens, my whole perspective was different. So I, from the point I started to understand the spirit of what my dad did years after I physically lost him, I dedicated my life to being a person of impact and making a difference and leaving people in places better than I found them. And so when I said, after that conversation with Sue Ann, I get back in the lab, I get back in the home office and I'm in a private moment and I said, all right, Paul, impact. Can you create more impact inside of the walls of the sports industry or beyond? And that simple question is why I took the Jerry Maguire leap. Because staying in sports, I would have been leaving impact on the table and chasing impact for the rest of my life is making my hero proud. And that's why we're having this conversation. Wow. Wow. 
gosh, well, the confidence and the courage to leave a, a career like that to follow a value is remarkable. How scary was it? Not because because I made it for the right reasons and my heart knew that I had to do it. It felt like a non-negotiable. I, I just committed. Once I left that retreat, I just became really good at keeping promises that I make to myself. Before that, just like anybody else, self-limiting beliefs, doubts, fears, worries. I'm not saying I never feel those things, but the way I overcome it is if you're making your decisions and taking your actions based on who you are at your core, it doesn't feel scary. It doesn't because the worst case scenario is you don't get the outcome you want by pulling that trigger and then you end up figuring out a new way that feels right, that is right, that is you, that's authentic. Because the one thing I haven't shared, Brandon, this is super quick, but one of my core values being authenticity I left that retreat and I felt massive tension, man. I felt really like I, there was a knot in bigger than my stomach. Like it was just, I, I, I didn't feel right. I, I felt like I was living a fake life. Wow. And when your core value like authenticity, you hear fake. And so here's why. I had a work version of me and then a personal version of me. And after the retreat, I realized I was showing up very differently in very different environments. And the truth is, if we, if we don't lie to ourselves, you cannot be two people. I was lying to myself. I said, this is who I need to be in corporate. And this is who I can be in everywhere else. As long as nobody from corporate sees me, that's not real. Yeah. And so for me to be able to fuse and gel and become one version of me, that's why it wasn't scary to make these decisions. Because once I said, dude, no BS, man, what's in your heart and lead with your heart, because I forgot my heart at some point of the journey. In my second book, I talk about head, heart, hands, mindset, authenticity, and action. Brother, I was living in the head and hands game almost my whole career. Almost my whole career. And now I'm living almost exclusively in the heart and hands. Yeah, I'll check in and justify some things logically, sure. But if my heart says yes, I'm pulling a trigger and I'm going to just roll the dice. Yeah. I, I just am. Because if the outcome is what I wanted, oh my God, life, dude, like that, that's what life euphoria is all about. And if I lead with my heart and it doesn't work out, I won't die with regret. Yeah. But if you lead with your head and it doesn't work out, you will go to the tombstone with massive regret. Yeah. I love your story. One of the reasons I love your story is because, and I don't want to make this about me, it's not, but just very quickly. So I started my career um, as an attorney. I guess I'm still an attorney, but I started as a practicing lawyer at, at um, like the preeminent law firm in Atlanta, you know, the, sort of the, the, the golden ticket, the job that everybody yeah, wanted. Yeah, yeah. And I hated it. Hated it yeah. and ended up following my heart like like you. And the greatest decision I've ever made. And I love what I'm doing now. But so so it resonates with me. It resonates. Your story resonates with me. What was it, just really quickly, and then I want to I want to focus on exactly what you're doing now and how people yeah. can, can get involved there. But what was it at this retreat specifically that sort of flipped this light bulb or flipped this light switch? Excuse me. Do you know, or was it just, was it, was it, you know, just like the, the summation of, of the discussions? I've thought about that a lot. And the process of the retreat, the tightest way to describe it is you do a lifeline exercise. You draw a horizontal line through a blank sheet of paper. On the left side is birth. On the right side is present day. Above the line are peaks. Below the line are valleys. And you share the stories of your peaks and valleys with a partner. And my deepest, darkest valley was losing my hero at 19 years old and losing my dad. And I had never told anybody at work that I lost my dad. You know, like it just, you don't talk about it. Sports is 
massively lacking vulnerability, massively. It's a lot of ego, a lot of alpha, a lot of, you know, perform at all cost type mentality. And so I never felt safe. I, I wasn't psychologically safe to, which is why I had to create the work version of Paul. All right. Okay. And so this retreat where I'm bawling my guts out and talking about my lost hero, it, it wasn't because I was talking about my dad that I cried. It was because of, I felt like I was, and this is, I'm not criticizing anybody in any industry. This is just a conversation with myself that I had with myself. I think I was crying because I was disappointed that I had tucked this pain away for so long in an environment that if you do the math, you're going to work over a hundred thousand hours over the course of a career. So to think that the biggest chunk of your living hours where you're awake, you're going to do this thing called work. And to think I couldn't talk about the things and the people that are most meaningful to me in a vulnerable way. Again, I'm not knocking an industry for that sure. statement. I'm saying for me, I was crying because I realized like, this isn't real. And yeah, I, I, I don't want to open up my Monday morning sales meeting and be like, hey, guess what? I lost my dad. Like, of course not. But I also think like shame on me and shame on us that we never really got there. And so like the reason I think it opened me up and I was so willing to change coming out of the retreat. And I'll tell you this, Brandon, here's a very fun, positive way of thinking about it my favorite part of what I currently do, which my calling is keynote speaking. I do other things besides keynote speaking, but like, that's what I want to be doing until the day I die. Like hundred percent, you cannot take those stages away from me. Like that is where I'm supposed to be. Breathing life into rooms and people and making people and places better than I found. I'm like, that's why I'm here on this earth. Now, my favorite part of being a keynote speaker is it reconnected with me with my dad. Mm -hmm. because I literally yeah. close every keynote sharing the story of my dad. And then of course, applying it to the audience to make it impactful. So they remember it to, and apply it to their own lives. And that's a whole nother conversation. But I feel so connected to my dad and I, he passed away in 2021. Sorry. Um, 2001. I was like, wait, that was way too recent. Yeah. He passed away over two decades ago and I feel closer to him now than even when I was physically with him. Wow. And I owe that to this Jerry Maguire elite. I owe that to being able to talk about him, not just safely, but inspirationally. Like I, I've told my dad's story now to close to a million people. Like that, that's, that's so cool, man. It's so cool. So you said you have five kiddos, you know, I, I don't know if we were on camera or off camera, but you're a dad, man. Like, yep. dude, like imagine one of your kids is, is connecting to you based on finding their calling. Like, I, I bet you that would be one of the proudest moments of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I lost my dad when I was 11. And so huh. it, 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 so much of, I mean, I, I keep wanting to <laughs> jump in because so much of what you're saying, I just, I want to jump up and down and be like, yes, and give you a big hug. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's extremely inspirational to me as I, I'm sure it will be to, to, uh, to the audience as well. So, so tell us, we, I got to wrap this up uh, here in a minute. Time flies sure. when you got a good guess. But so t tell, tell us about you know, exactly what you're doing at the moment. Make sure, to, um, if you can, to mention your books. Yeah, absolutely. And for people that are, that are intrigued or interested or inspired, where can they go to connect with you? So the, the home of everything is paulepsteinspeaks.com. But let me just say this. Besides paulepsteinspeaks.com, just to connect with everyone listening in, if this conversation in the spirit of it has if you feel like you're ready to do more, do better, do different, if you're ready for that transformation, if you're ready to grow, just like I was post-retreat, the Monday after the retreat was where my life changed. I believe that next Monday can be equally transformational for you. So when you see me wearing a shirt, win Monday, when you hear my podcast, win Monday, when I say from stage, win Monday, the ROI of every time I connect with an audience, even in a podcast, it's the decisions we make and the actions we take on Monday morning. So where I want it from my heart, invite everybody is go to winmonday.win. It's called winmonday.win, Monday Momentum. It's me in your inbox 52 Mondays a year with one thing, one idea, one strategy, one tool, one tactic, one way that you can win Monday 
so you have momentum to win the week. So at winmonday.win, putting your name and email, it's a free gift from my heart to invite you in to the Win Monday community. That would mean more than anything. Of course, as a leader, if you have a team, an organization, a culture, bringing me in to speak, paulepsteinspeaks.com, amazing. Books are going to be on the website. Everything's going to be on the website. But for you personally, as a human being, winmonday.win is where your Monday momentum journey starts. Awesome. Fantastic. So in addition to keynotes, tell us quickly about your books and, and your, your organization and what your focus is right now in terms of, if in like two minutes, I'm sorry. I know we got it. We got to no, jump. No, no, we no, no. Yeah, we're but, good. We're good. Uh, okay. and, and look, the organization is win Monday. Like at the end of the day, like no plug for any organization, but, but here's the, okay. the quick and dirty of the books. Two books, both bestsellers instantly, very humbled to say that. The Power of Playing Offense was my first book. It was the leadership playbook that I never had. When I got promoted from player to coach and you sell things and they say supervise the sellers and I said, where's the playbook? And they gave me a blank stare and they said, good luck. I knew that was not right. And so instead of moaning and groaning about it, I wrote the solution a decade later. It was what I needed as a leader. So five pillars of playing offense, first two on leading self, third and fourth on leading others, the fifth on leading into the future. That's the transformation of the power of playing offense. That's the first book. Second book is really an outgrowth. It's a 2.0 of the first book, Better Decisions Faster. I started to study what separates offensive versus defensive people, teams, and organizations. And my team and I did the research and we found that decisiveness was the number one separator. And so if decisiveness and making decisions is going to be what leads to a winning life, oh, well, let's not just make decisions. Let's make them better and faster. Fun right. fact, the average adult makes 35,000 decisions in a day. I did not write the book to master all 35,000 because most are on autopilot. So you don't need a book to turn left in the driveway or brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. I, I think I hope. But what I did in the sports fashion of an MVP, a most valuable player, I wrote the book for your MVDs, your most valuable decisions. The ones of higher consequence, the ones that matter more, as a leader, strategy A or B, team, do I hire or fire? Do I spend my time on X or Y? Do I make the investment or not? What are my goals for this coming year? The quality of those decisions is going to dictate the quality of your life. The quality of those decisions is going to dictate the quality of your business. I wrote the book for that. And that's really where we land the plane. The process inside of the book is called the head, hard, hands equation. When your head and heart are on board, it's a green light. No head, no heart, red light. One of the two, head or heart on board, yellow light. If you want a green light life, if you want to stop running reds, and if you want to conquer and navigate that messy middle of yellow where your head and heart are not always on board, well, that's exactly why I wrote the book, Better Decisions Faster. Awesome. Awesome. Like as a, as a business leader myself, the, those are two, you know, playing offense in terms of the, the understanding really what it means to be a leader and a strategy for doing so, and then a framework within which to sort of digest and understand decisions. I mean, those, those are that you sort of, you hit the, the soul of what being a business leader is with those two. It sounds to me like, um, which by the way, I ordered both of them earlier, this, earlier this afternoon. That's not, Oh, a, love it. That's just love it. It's not a, that's not a plug or, or a, or a kiss up. It's no, just, thank it's you. just the truth. Um, and look, I got to let you go. I got one final question. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to the Paul that just graduated from USC that was driving down the road listening to Mel Kuyper and you could you were permitted to travel back in time and tell that Paul that version of you one thing what would you tell him live a green light life and here's what I mean by that when you're heading harder on board it's a green light. The world is going to pull you to make the smart decision. Paul, go make the heart decision. Heart decisions win the long game. Heart decisions mean you won't die with regret. Heart decisions lead to happiness. Heart decisions lead to fulfillment. Heart decisions lead to passion, purpose, impact, legacy. Heart decisions make you a better parent. Heart decisions make you a better student. Heart decisions, I could keep going. I would just go all in on the heart. You're going to get enough head 
in the world. You're going to get enough strategy. You're going to think. You're going to overthink. You might get paralyzed. So I'd say, screw that, Paul. Nobody needs to remind you to do that. But what we do need that constant reminder of, and what I would tell 22-year-old Paul is, if your heart is not on board, then you're never going to live a green light life. So start with your heart and go chase that. That's what I would tell the 22-year-old version of me. It's fantastic. And, and not enough focus is, is placed on authenticity, vulnerability, and you know, things like heart, what you're feeling, et cetera. I, I imagine, especially in, in pro sports, this isn't something that is, that is front of mind. But look, you, you have been so gracious with your time. And, I, and we are fortunate to be able to listen to your story and your wisdom and advice for the last hour. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and hopefully all of our guests go to winmonday.win and uh, over to Paul Epstein Speaks um, to get, learn more about the books and the speaking opportunities. So look, great stuff, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Love the conversation. Don't forget, everybody, you can find Boundary Breakers in a lot of places. You can watch our episodes on the Boundary Breakers YouTube channel, or you can listen to each podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the other major podcasting platforms. Thanks for listening.